The nation today is mourning the loss of a trailblazing senator, Dianne Feinstein. And here with me now is Dianne Feinstein's very close friend, colleague, ally, Speaker Emeritus Nancy Pelosi. My condolences to you, to your family. You were neighbors in San Francisco for years. I know your daughter, uh, Nancy Corinne, thinks of her as an aunt, as a member of the family, and sure, as yeah. do you. I know this. Well, my children would always say, uh, if Nancy, if, if, if Diane and I were running against each other for office, Nancy Corinne would probably be for Diane. <laughs> your own <laughs> and daughter. Then Catherine said, well, then maybe I'll be for you, Catherine, her daughter. This is for us very personal. It's very San Francisco. We're neighbors. We're friends. We love each other very much. I'm heartbroken. But Diane would want us all to just rise to the occasion. And I want you to, you know, but I want everyone to know, this is an iconic figure. This is a figure who, uh, every now and then someone comes along like this that you, you think, wow, she came into power as mayor under the most dire of circumstance, such strength, such dignity. She took the city with her in all of this. In everything that she did, she did with a vision of doing some great thing and knowing what she was talking about, always reading in that. So, so she was great. She was, we use the word iconic more than we should probably. This is the definition the personification of iconic, and I mean there were there were so many sides to her. She was a friend. She was a great woman and an advocate for women's <laughs> reproductive rights, for women's leadership. But at the same time, she was all about work. She was always thinking about what to do next. She did her homework. Yes. And I'm thinking about an interview that we did. We played a little bit of it earlier from February of 2012 where I was asking her about the controversy because the assault ban had, you know, sunsetting. It was 1994, so it was already a big issue trying to get the assault ban back in place or to keep it. And she talked about the fact that, uh, with, for her, it was a passion. And getting that assault ban in her freshman term mm -hmm. as a senator and that Joe Biden, judiciary chairman at the time, had said, well, you'll never get that done. The gun lobby will kill you. And that she said, we're going to get it done. <clears throat> A lot of people have taken credit for that. It was she who pushed that through. Well, she came into the Senate in 1993. <clears throat> this bill passed the Congress, signed by the president in 1994. Right. And so uh, she, she did. And again, because of the standing that she had, the experience that she had, she was not taking no for an answer. And I will tell you, that because I was a lowly junior member working under the leadership of Chuck Schumer at the time, who carried the mantle in the House, and as he said beautifully on the floor, worked with Dianne Feinstein on this, it was hard because it wasn't, as she would say, uh, easy for members to vote for it in, coming from certain districts. But she gave them the, the path. She gave them the goal and the path. And working with the Bradys, everyone, we, we got it done. But it would not have happened without Dianne Feinstein. And no, no offense to Joe Biden or anyone else. They were just telling her the facts of life. This is going to be hard. And we weren't even able to pass the rules right in the beginning. And then we were. Also, of course, the Senate Intelligence Committee, she's the first woman intelligence chair. You were a leader in the House on intelligence. Yeah. You know what it meant to take on the CIA and the White House after 9-11. Um, we actually have something uh, about that on the torture report when she was being pilloried for this, for with John McCain in a bipartisan way, which is classic Feinstein, working on trying to get that, that report out and get it through the Senate and change the law. Let's watch. So you've just made it very clear that this all started under Jay Rockefeller when he was chair of the committee. Uh, he is a man, not given to being emotional, I guess, uh, as you as chair are. I mean, where do we come down in this day and age where a woman who is chair of the Intelligence Committee, because of seniority and expertise and all the rest that goes into that, gets accused of being emotional in having uh, 
worked on this report well, and, <clears throat> and that, that's basically I think an old, backed the staff on this yeah. report. I think that's an all, old male fallback position. And there's no question that there are a lot of people out there. I suspect one of them is former CIA director Hayden that does not want the report to come out. So one of the things you do is uh, try to blur the reputation of someone connected with the report. I suspect you've also heard people say, <laughs> Nancy Pelosi, that you're being emotional when you push for certain things that are hard to do. I don't even pay attention to that, but let me just say about Diane. Uh, in terms of this, because I was, I had 30 years on the Intelligence Committee, some of it at that time ex officio as, as a speaker or leader, depending on what was, uh, what, what the timing was. But she did, the, she, Diane left us the way she lived, on her own terms. She knew what she wanted to get accomplished. She respected diversity of opinion. She was as bipartisan as they come, respectful but not uh, uh, departing from the position. And uh, she was not going to be bothered about anybody saying that she was emotional. That's the other person's problem. That's not her problem. One of the moments that I recall also was at the end of the 2008 campaign, uh, she was defeated by Barack Obama. It was a bitter primary season. He's now elected. He's the president-elect. And she invited Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton to her home. Uh, really for a peace talk, because the two camps, not the principals, but the two camps were very bitter after that campaign. And there were people resisting any offer for her to join the cabinet. And then she left them, the two of them together. And my reporting from this is that that was the beginning of the possibility that she would accept an offer to join the cabinet and become a secretary of state. You probably have better insights than I. Well, I... I... I don't, uh, because I don't know the particulars. But I do know that Diane believes in bringing people together. Let's share our thoughts, our values, our challenges. And I th she always did believe that our what we had in common was more than what we, we were uh, uh, disagreeing on. So she, that gave her hope, confidence about doing something like that. And she's Diane Feinstein. She had uh, the heft politically and et cetera, speaking, that they would accept her invitation, that they would accept her invitation uh, at, with the prospect that such a conversation would take place. But she believed in herself. She believed in, she, she was about goodness. She was about greatness. She was about love. She was about power and using it. She was about strength. I just want to make sure everybody knows that this giant of a person, this trailblazer, this icon, this champion, this hero, walked among us, and we all benefited from it. More importantly, the American people did. And in San Francisco, we just look forward to welcoming her back home. Uh, of course, she's always back and forth, but home to rest so that she can rest in peace. Nancy Pelosi, Speaker Emerita, thank you very much. It's a tough day for you. And thanks for sharing your thoughts thank with us. You. I appreciate that. And thank you for your attention to Diane. Absolutely.